right, moving into section 1.4 of our chapter 1 of college algebra, we're going to be looking at the composition of functions. And so in a previous section, we had talked about adding and subtracting, multiplying, dividing functions, um, in which those are operations of functions. And so we're going to add to that with a fifth operation, in which we refer to as the composition of functions. So when the output of one function is used as the input of another, we call that entire operation a composition of functions. So, a little bit of a delay. Composition of functions. And so, um, mathematically, giving that to you, we have to do some evaluations of functions. And so, what we've done in previous sections to um, not only with numbers, but also with variables, uh, we're going to be using that here. So, the composition of the function f and g denoted by f with an open circle. I'm going to undo that so I can definitely define F open circle G kind of almost looks like fog. Some of my previous students have mentioned that it is the fog function, but it is not. It's F with an open circle G is defined by where I have Okay, let's try it now. F composed with G of X is equal to F of G of X. Okay, so we kind of have an inside function and an outside function. So this being my inside function, this piece here being my outside function within that. So now, when we talk about putting two functions like this together, we can talk about their domain. So the domain of the composite function is going to be the set of all x such that x is in the domain of g and g of x or g is in the domain of f. So it's almost like they're kind of in a backward sense. So don't get too caught up on domains. When we get to that piece of it, we'll look at them individually, okay? All right, so what is the meaning of kind of what the input of one function affects the input of another function? Here's kind of just a basic example of it before we get into some of our functions. And it says that suppose C of S gives the number of calories burned doing S number of sit-ups, and S of T gives the number of sit-ups a person can do in T minutes. So they put meaning to it. C stands for calories. S here is standing for sit-ups, for S sit-ups. And S here is the sit-ups after T minutes. So they prepped us for that. Now, can we interpret a C of S of 3? Well, remember what S of T was. S of a number is the number of sit-ups after so many minutes. So the three here is representing three minutes. So the three minutes of sit-ups would result in a certain number of calories. So if I'm going to do a description here of this, we could say that this function represents the number of calories For it to write, number of calories burned after three minutes of sit-ups. Okay, so kind of just putting meaning to each one of those. So the number of calories burned after our three minutes of sit-ups. And I apologize for the delay here. On that. So, there'll be certain real world situations that you might use this for. 
our primary focus is to be able to look at a function or functions and be able to do some compositions of those, okay? So the first thing that we're going to look at, just like we've done in the past sections, is we're going to look at some tables, we're going to look at some graphs, and we're also going to look at some functions. And so here I have two tables, one for the graph of f and one for the graph of g. And we are wanting to evaluate these compositions. Now, I did say for compositions, we're going to kind of focus on this inside function. We're going to work from the inside out. So you may want to kind of put that in your notes somewhere. Work from the inside out. So in this case, I need to determine what g of 1 is first. So I'm going to rewrite the f in the parentheses. And I'm going to come over here to this table. And this tells me that I have all these x values going into the g function and I end up with all these outputs here, okay? The one I'm concerned about over here is g of 1. So on my g table, I'm going to win x equals 1. What is the y value for the g function? And it is 3. So that g of 1, I can replace all of that with just the y value that it's equal to, which is 3. Now at this point, we're going to take that 3 and put it into the f function. So that means we now need to go to the f table and find where 3 is. Well, it's here. What's the y value that matches with that? It is that 3. Therefore, the whole thing is equal to 3. Let's do that again. Okay, got to see it a couple times, maybe 3 or 4 times. g of f of 3. Again, we're going to start from the inside and work ourselves out to the g function. So I'm going to rewrite g of what? Well, that what is what is f of 3. So I'm going to my f function. When x equals 3, what is the y value? Well, we just found that. That is 3. So I'm going to replace the inside piece here with 3. And now this tells me I have to take the 3 and put it into the g function. So when x equals 3 in the g function, what is the matching y value? It is a 2. Therefore, the whole thing, g of f of 3, is equal to 2. Okay? All right, now... Nothing says you have to do two different functions within a composition. There are times when you might have to compose with the same function. So again, I'm going to work myself from the inside out. So I'm going to have that f of 4 that I need to do first. So I'm going to do f of with my parentheses. And then I'm going to end up turning to the f function when x equals 4. What is the matching y value? When x equals 4, the matching y value is 1. Therefore, f of 4 equals 1. Now I have to take that inside number, place it into the f function again. So I'm out here going on the f function where x equals 1. What is the matching y value? It is a 6. Therefore, f of 1 is equal to 6. And the whole thing, the composition of f of f of 4, equals 6. Now, g of g of 3, what do I have to do? I have to go on the inside first, and then I'm going to put that into the outside function. So let's go g of what? When x equals 3, I need to figure out what's the matching y value in my g function. So when x equals 3, the matching y value on the g function is 2. So this whole piece inside here, that g of 3, is equal to 2. Now I have to then take the x value of 2 and plug it into the g function. So x value of 2 and the g function, it kicks out a 5. Therefore, the whole composition g of g of 3 is equal to 5. Okay? All right. Let's move on to some graphs. Remember, these are just like tables except for we have points on here. And you can kind of see the nice points, like this is a point 1, 2, this is the point 2, 5, here is 3, 6. If you need to label those points with their ordered pair to make you helpful, then please do so. So let's do these compositions. I have f of g of 2. Work on the inside. I'm going to my g function, which is over here. I'm going along my x-axis when x equals 2. 
and I find out that my graph crosses at that point. Now, what is that point? That point is the point 2, 0. So when x equals 2, my function value at 2 is 0. That's what this piece is. That's at g of 2. So I'm going to replace g of 2 with a 0. And now I have to take that number, chain react back, and now go into the f function. Okay? So we're going along here when x equals 0, which is right here. What is the y value? Well, look down on my graph. There's the point on the graph. It is the point 0, negative 3. Therefore, f of 0 is negative 3. So in two steps here, I have that this whole composition equals negative 3. Now, what about g of f of 2? I'm going to go on the inside. I have to find out f of 2. Here's my f function. I'm going to look along the x-axis when x equals 2. I'm going to find the point. That is actually the point 2, 5. So if I ask what is f of 2, again, what we're asking for is what's the matching y value when x equals 2. Therefore, this inside piece is 5. And now we have to take that and put it into the outside function, which in this case is the g function. So when x equals 5, what is the y value on g? So again, go along the x-axis for x equaling 5. Find its point. I'm going to claim it to be there. And that is the ordered pair of 5, 3. And that gives me the y value for g of 5. When x equals 5, what is it on the g value? It is at a value of 3. Okay? So make sure it's not that it's hard. It's just that you got to have it in the right order. Okay? All right, let's do f of f of 1. I need to go on the inside where x equals 1 on the f function. Here's my point. That is the point 1, 2. What is the y value when x equals 1? It is 2. So this whole piece inside here can come out and make it a 2. But now I have to go into the outside function. Well, this time it's a function composed with itself. So now when x equals 2 on the f function, what is the y value? x equals 2. The y value that matches with that is 5. Therefore, f of f of 1 equals 5. Okay. Now, what about g of g of 5? Now we're on the g function totally. Okay. So we're going to start when x equals 5. And I'm going to come over here. When x equals 5, I'm going to find the matching y value, which is right there. Okay. Which is 3. We already found that. So 3 goes inside here, and now we have to take 3 into the g function. So when x equals 3, what is the y value on g? When x equals 3, what is the y value on g? That is the point 3, negative 1. Therefore, this answer is negative 1. Okay? All right, very good. So here we're looking at tables and graphs. Now we are going to move on to our functions. So be very careful. I'm changing names here. I'm giving you an f of x and an h of x, but it's just the same. It's just identifying what function we need to go on. All right, so this time we actually have to use the rule of f says to take 5 times my number and add 1. h says to take 3 times my number and add 2. Again, we're going to start on the inside and work ourselves out. So here, if I'm going to look at what is h of 2, that tells me I need to take x equaling 2 into the h function. So I'm going to take out the x, place in a 2, so I end up getting 3 times 2, add 2. That's the h of 2. Now, by order of operations, I can determine what this is. So I'm going to rewrite my f. I'm going to multiply before I add. So I get 6 plus 2, which gives me an 8. And now I have to, when x equals 8, what is it into the f function? So here's kind of step 2. You have to place it into that second function. So if I now take 8 and plug it in for the x of my f function, so take that piece out. That now gets replaced with an 8. I have 5 times 8 plus 1, and by order of operations, this becomes 40 plus 1, and my final answer is 41. So you have to kind of do these operations twice. 
when you're working with composition of functions, starting on the inside, working yourself to the outside, okay? So in part B, we're going to start with the f function. When x equals negative 3, plug it into the f function. So I'm going to just rewrite h. Give me some room here to show my work. I'm going to take negative 3, plop it right in there for x. So that means 5 times negative 3 and add 1. Just like before, we have to multiply before we add. So we end up getting 5 times a negative 3, different signs. The answer is negative. 5 times 3 is 15, so negative 15 plus 1. And getting down to one number gets me negative 14. And we're not done because that's only evaluating one function. Now when x equals negative 14, I have to put that into my h function on the outside. Now if x equals negative 14... We're going right up here where I scribbled out the x. If that helps you out, please do so. We take 3 times our x value, which is negative 14, and then we add 2 to that. That's what my rule tells me to do for the h function. We're again going to multiply before we add, so we get a negative 42 plus 2. And if I owe you 42 bucks and I pay you $2, by integers, you're going to subtract those numbers and give the answer the larger numbers sign. So negative 40 should be my answer for that one. Okay? All right. So those are two that include numbers. Here I have one that's including a variable. So here I have to take h of x and put it into the function. So your answer will more than likely have a variable in it. So all I'm going to do, what is h of x equal to? h of x is equal to 3x plus 2, okay? So I need to take 3x plus 2 and put it in for h of x, okay? So when I do that, I'm rewriting the f. Let me do that kind of in red. So we have f of h of x was 3x plus 2. Now, the same idea happens here. It's just a little bit stranger because I have to work with letters and such with your variables. If x equals, or if an inside piece is 3x plus 2, we're evaluating f there. That means just like whenever I took um, this negative 3 and put it right in here, I'm going to take this whole expression, 3x plus 2, and put it right in there. So now I have like 5, then a 3x plus 2, and the rule up here on f, remember, says to add 1 at the end. So when I have 5 times 3x plus 2, then I have to add 1 to that. Be very careful when you're working with expressions because this 5 has to be multiplied by the whole thing. And in order to do that, I need parentheses there around that expression. So we are going to now distribute... 5 times 3x and 5 times 2 gives me a 15x plus 10. Don't forget your plus 1. And then we're going to combine like terms to get as much simplified as we can. So if there's another x to go with 15, by all means, put that together. But there is not, so I only have two numbers here that I can put together. Final answer, 15x plus 10 plus 1 is 11. And that's okay for your answer to be ending in an expression. You're not always going to get a number. All right, I know this is kind of strange a little bit, but we're going to continue and we're going to find this out with numbers and with letters still, okay? This will lead us into section 1-6, um, which is going to be on uh, inverses, which we need compositions for. Now, we're going to use these two formulas. I have a linear and a quadratic to find these values. Now here I use that fog notation, okay? If you want to write it as f of g of negative 1, because that's what we've been using most often, and I'll tell you that's what's used most often, then do so. I'm going to now, again, just like before, I'm going to replace negative 1 in for x for the g function. So I'm going to rewrite f. Now, the g function says that I have to square my number, then subtract that number, then subtract 1. So there's multiple places to put it in. 
So I'm going to square my number, negative 1 squared, minus that number, and then subtract 1. So that, again, is just evaluating g of negative 1. Put negative 1 here and here. Now, order of operations says I have to do my exponents, which means I get a positive 1 when I do negative 1 squared. Double negatives here, remember, become a positive, so I'm going to make that a plus 1, and then I have my minus 1 at the end. Now, what does that look like? That looks like the 1 and the negative 1 can go away, canceling them out. Therefore, I'm looking for what is f of 1 to get to my final answer. So here's the second function that we have to plug it into. In the f function, I'm going to let x equal 1. So I'm going to put x equaling 1 right here. And that tells me I have to take 2 times my number and add 6 for that rule. Again, order of operation says that multiply comes first. 2 plus 6 now does give me a final answer of 8. Okay. All right. Here's another one. Notice I don't give you a number, I just give you a letter. I give you a letter here, give you a letter here, so your answer will more than likely have a letter in it. This time again, I'm going to rewrite this of the form that we're used to seeing, which is that g of f of x. And so this time, I need to make sure that I'm taking that f function and I'm plugging it into the g function, okay? So f is what? The f was 2x plus 6, so I'm going to replace f of x with what it's equal to. That's just a straight substitution. Okay, now I need to take this whole thing and plug it into g. g is right here. What did that tell me to do? It told me to square what's inside there, subtract that same thing, and then subtract 1. So I need to square what's inside there, subtract the same thing, that expression. So we're going to subtract the 2x plus 6, and then it tells me to subtract 1. So again, that is taking what's inside there, replacing the x value in my function with what is inside, and that is 2x plus 6. Now, Here's a thing that we have not reviewed yet, something that you learned in Algebra 1 called FOIL. If you are squaring this, that doesn't mean that you just take 2x times 2x and then 6 times 6. You cannot just square these individually. That means by the power of 2, I have to write that out twice and do what we call FOIL. Okay, so 2x plus 6 times 2x plus 6, and if you have not uh, reviewed FOIL lately and need to do so, make sure that you go to Khan Academy or something like that and review FOIL, um, or I can help you with that as well. So when you multiply in a FOIL, FOIL stands for first, outer, inner, last. So I need to multiply the first two terms together, 2x times 2x, 2 times 2 is a 4, x times x is an x squared. Outside gives me 2x times 6, which gives me a 12x. Let me erase this real quick here. Oh, I can see that. So 4x squared outside, 2x times a 6, 2 times 6 is 12 Tag the x on behind. The inside terms, 6 times 2x gives me another 12x. Okay. We're having a delay. All right, so 6 times 2x gives me another 12x. And then my last term here ends up getting 6 times 6 together which gives me a 36. Okay, oops, I just didn't write the x, so make sure that's a 12x there. All right, so when combining like terms, the only thing I can combine together are the inside pieces. So I'm going to come back to this piece and say, okay, 
This is a 4x squared. When I combine 12x plus 12x, that gives me a 24x. And then add to that a 36. Now, we have to distribute that negative through. So negative 1, kind of treated as an invisible, would be a minus 2x. Negative times a positive 6 is a minus 6, and then don't forget your plus 1. And so now we're very, very close to finishing this up. We just now have to combine like terms on this final account. So I'm going to combine the x's, then I'm going to combine the numbers that I see there together. Nothing that can be combined with 4x squared. So the final answer here is going to be 4x squared. When you do 24x minus a 2x, that gives me a 22x. And then for our numbers, we're going to take a plus 36 minus a 6 minus a 1 gives me a positive 29. And that would be our final answer for that problem. Okay? All right. So I wanted to do some fractions. Because I just know how everybody loves fractions. So I want to see, or you to see how these work. So again, don't panic when you have fractions. It is the same principle. You're replacing the x values with something. And it, in this case, will not be numbers. It's going to be variables, okay? So for this first one, I need to take the g of x function and put it into f. So I'm first going to rewrite the g of x function in here as a 4 over x minus 2, that is the piece that I need to throw into the x in the f function. So if I take that 4x, 4, 4 over x minus 2, and I plug that in here for this x value, I'm going to take all that out and put all of this in, okay? So that's equal to 1 all over, because I'm going off of here, the f function says we have 1, all over whatever that is in my parentheses, so 4 over x minus 2, and then I need to add 2 to it. That's what my function tells me. 1 over what's inside plus 2. 1 over what's inside plus 2. Now I get a simplified, okay? First off, treat this, the bottom kind of as grouping symbols, or the top, but the top's already simplified. So I'm going to go ahead and do that addition, negative 2 plus 2. So what results is 1 all over 4 over x. That would be what happens, um, That what I get to next. And so basically that's taking 1 all over a fraction. Now you can look at it two ways. Remember 1 over a number is always the reciprocal. So then you can flip that fraction to get x over 4. That's one way. The other way is to just divide these two numbers. Now 1, I can write as 1 over 1. And when you divide two fractions, recall that you rewrite the first one and then you multiply. So that changes from a divide to a multiply by the flip of the second. So you flip the second fraction and you get an x over 4. And now it comes to be a multiply problem. And once you have that problem, when you're multiplying, you can cross cancel if you want or if you can, or you can go straight across. So 1 times x is x, 1 times 4 is 4, therefore x over 4 would be my final answer in this case. Okay, now if we look at the very last problem here, where uh, for the fractions, I'm looking at taking the f function and putting it into the g function, okay? So for the first step, I'm just going to keep that g on the outside. And then in the parentheses, I'm going to take our f function and place it in for f of x. So that would look like 1 over x plus 2. Okay, 1 over x plus 2. And that 1 over x plus 2 has to now be placed into the g function. So here's my x. So I'm going to take out one letter and I'm going to put all of this in to the g function. So g of x, 1 over x plus 2 is 4 all over. Take the x out and place it in with what you have inside your parentheses. So yes, it looks a little strange, but that is correct. 
So we end up having 4 all over x, 1 over x plus 2. And then our function says to subtract 2 from that. And so now the task is to simplify this. So you need to make sure you can simplify as far as you can. All right, so again, I'm going to do this idea of multiplying uh, the reciprocal of the fraction. So I'm going to rewrite 4 as 4 over 1 times that by the flip of the denominator. So that becomes an x plus 2 over 1. And then I have to subtract 2. Now, if I have 4 over 1 and x plus 2 over 1, those 1s on the bottom don't really care. Okay, you can divide. It still would be 4. It would still be x plus 2. So technically, I'm going to have to end up taking 4, distributing that through the x plus 2 because you're multiplying the whole thing. So 4 times x ends up with a 4x. 4 times 2 ends up with a plus 8. And don't forget your minus 2 here. So I need to simplify my two numbers together at the end. So this final answer that I have, rewrite your 4x and 8 minus 2 gives me a positive 6. So 4x plus 6 would be my final answer. Okay? All right, very good. So now, after we've practiced finding different compositions, now we are going to focus on, on this problem, a domain. So in the very first box, we talked about the domains of those. Don't freak out too much on that wording. Basically, we have to keep in check the domain of F, the domain of G, and the domain of our composition. Okay, so let's first find our composition. Practice it one more time. Where I'm going to take the F function and put it into the G function. So I get G of, what is the F function? That rule is to take the square root of X plus 1. And so that square root of X plus 1 is what I need to put into my G function here. And so that tells me on the G function to square what's inside there and then subtract 4. So I need to take what's inside there, the square root of X plus 1, and square it and then subtract 4. That's what my rule says to do. Take what's inside here, square it, and then subtract 4. So if I take the square root of something squared, remember at the very start we were talking about in, oh, and then our next section we're going to talk about uh, inverses of each other. So if I'm adding, the inverse of that is subtracting. If I'm squaring, the undoing or the inverse of that is the square root. So in a sense, I like to say that those two things kind of cancel themselves out. Okay, if you square a square root, the square root is gone leaving me with what's underneath there, which is an x plus 1. Then I have to subtract 4 and combine like terms to get a final answer of x minus 3 when I take 1 minus 4. Okay? So that's my composition, x minus 3. Now hopefully you know that that number, when we talk domains, this was a polynomial sense where I said, okay, I can put whatever number I want in there and always subtract 3. No matter how pretty or nice that number is, then the domain of this function is all real numbers. Okay? Now, if I talk about the domain of f and the domain of g, we're going to have to kind of mold all those things together. Now, this domain of our result is going to be all real numbers. Let's look at g first. If I look at that x squared minus 4 function, no matter how nice or ugly the number is, when I square any number, I can always do that, and then I can subtract 4. So, doesn't matter what number I get, the domain of g is going to be all real numbers. Now, the problem is, is the f function. If you recall with square roots, and you can go back in your notes earlier in chapter 1, we said that with square roots, anything underneath that radical had to be 0 or had to be positive. So to find the domain of a square root function, we set what's inside there greater than or equal to 0. So when I do that, I get x plus 1 greater than or equal to 0. And when I'm asking to solve for x, I have to undo that by subtracting 1 from both sides. And I get x has to be greater than or equal to negative 1. Now, 
That's the only problem that I have. I don't have to mold it together with these all real numbers, but I have to kind of, it is the overlap of that. So even though these are all real numbers, the domain of F is kind of leading what the domain of all of this is going to be. So our domain of G of F of X is actually going to be negative 1 to infinity, which is this piece here in interval notation. So from negative 1 to infinity, that will give us our domain of our composition. So you always have to just kind of mold those together, okay? So we won't hit too much on those, but we will kind of see it just a little bit, okay? Now, our last little piece here, if I can get my extended page, is to talk about decomposing compositions. So when I'm decomposing, I'm actually going backwards, okay? And dividing two original functions that give me the composition, okay? So I'm going to kind of do a hint here. We are going to let the expression be the inside function. So we will have two different functions. In this case, it's asking for f and g for the composition. So we are going to, sorry, my C is a little big there. Okay, so we need to define f and g so that when I do f of g of x, I get 2x squared minus 3 to the fifth power. Okay, so that's my composition. And notice, I had to take the g function and place it into the f function. Now, what I just set up here with the hint was, let the expression of the problem be the inside function. So if I do that, again, we're going to separate, what is f of x and what is g of x? If I let g of x equal the expression in the problem, that's like the multiple terms that I have there. And I'll warn you, there are multiple answers to these types of problems. This is just one way, and actually the easiest, most straightforward way. So I'm going to let the inside function be the expression. Now, remember what we did before. We took out the x and we replaced it. Where was it? Let me scoot up a little bit. We took out the x and replaced it with what was inside there. So now we're going to take out the expression and replace it with an x. So if you notice what's left over within this composition is a power of 5. So I'm going to take out that expression and replace it with x. And in this case, we're raising it to the fifth power. Therefore, I have now decomposed that composition of functions. If I take this and put it in here, I get back what we started with. So this would be my answer. Again, be very careful. Let the inside function be the expression. Okay? All right. So let's try this one. This one here also is f of g of x. That's equal to the square root of x squared plus 5. Okay? Ah. And so that is my composition. Then the g function then our g function has to be the inside piece, therefore it is going to equal the expression. So if I need to separate f of x and g of x, the expression in this problem are the variables that end up having pluses and minuses attached with them. And so here, that expression is that x squared plus 5. So I'm going to let that x squared plus 5 equal the inside function, which is the g. And now I need to take that, and what did we put that in? Well, the other piece of our composition shows that square root symbol. So remember, going backwards, we're going to take out the expression and replace it with an x. So if I just have the square root of x there, that is the original function that I had to have in order for us to take this x squared plus 5, 
place it into the F function when I'm doing that composition. Okay, so your final answer for this one, actually one of the final answers would be this, the square root of X for F and X squared plus five for the G function, okay? So that is all for section one four. We are going to move on in section one five and do some stuff on transformations of functions. So what we did in section one with those basic graphs, we're gonna have to come back to, okay? And we're gonna move them all around. So until next time.